Well, good morning, uh, brothers and sisters and friends. It's nice to be with you together uh, this morning. Um, I wasn't originally scheduled to preside, but because of the COVID-19, uh, the fall gathering was canceled. So at the very least, we get to meet uh, like this over Zoom. And uh, just before the meeting, I was counting on my fingers how many months it's been since we were meeting like this. It's been, I figure, a, a good six months, if not just a little bit more. So it's 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 time has been flying, yeah. But um, it's good that we've been able to 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 meet like this. And um, this particular in this morning, uh, we'll we'll be focusing our minds um, on our memorial service, which is a memorial for Christ that he, the way he lived, the way he died, and that he is raised again to power and glory, and that we have a, a, a marvelous hope um, that he will come back to establish a kingdom to solve uh, the world's problems of sin and suffering and death. So um, it's something definitely worth keeping in mind and remembering, and that's what we're here to do this morning. It's a, it's, it's a positive and hopeful message that we're here to remember. Um, but also one that is um, carries great responsibility and 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 obligation for us in in, in remembering and serving our, our heavenly Father. So we have much to remember and keep in mind this morning. Um, and as we open, let's uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. We we come together to remember. Uh, that you are God, that you are the creator and sustainer of all life, that from time's beginning you have set in work a plan um, ever since the fall of man to, to restore him uh, to your side, to bring him back into perfect fellowship and harmony with you. And ever since the beginning, you, you promised a, a seed through whom you would you would accomplish this. And we know this seed to be Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're here to remember him this morning. We're here to remember his example of how we should live and to recognize our hope of dying in him and being resurrected with a similar resurrection to new life. And we thank you for the love you showed to this earth in sending your son and ask that you would help us to reflect that love in all that we say and do. Please be with us this morning um, and throughout this service. Help it to be a service that is uplifting and helped us to, to better become disciples and followers of Christ. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So for our, um, our readings this morning, we're going to be doing our New Testament readings from Galatians chapter 5 and 6. And uh, Brother Ken Eason has volunteered to read those for us. Good morning. Reading from Galatians chapters 5 and 6 from the New English Translation. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. And I testify again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we wait expectantly for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision carries any weight. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. You are running well, who prevented you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise. I am confident in the Lord that you will accept no other view, but the one who is confusing you 
will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Now, brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those agitators would go so far as to castrate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment, namely, you must love your neighbor as yourself. However, you continually bite and devour one another. Beware that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I am warning you, as I had warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. Brothers and sisters, if a person is discovered in some sin... You who are spiritual, restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. Pay close attention to yourselves so that you are not tempted to. Carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each one examine his own work. Then he can take pride in himself and not compare himself with someone else. For each one will carry his own load. Now the one who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with the one who teaches it. Do not be deceived. God will not be made a fool. For a person will reap what he sows. Because the person who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So we must not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who belong to the family of faith. See what big letters I make as I write to you with my own hand? Those who want to make a good showing in ex external matters are trying to force you to be circumcised. They do so only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not obey the law themselves, but they want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about your flesh. But may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that matters 
is a new creation. For all who will behave in accordance with this rule, peace and mercy be on them and on the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ken, for that reading. And now uh, um, we'll be given words of exhortation from Brother Justin Keene from the Kingston Ecclesia, who's kindly offered to step in um, to fill the, the void in our schedule due to the, uh, the gathering. And I now ask that you give your kind attention to Brother Justin Keene. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be with you. It's uh, really nice to be able to join your meeting. I didn't have to drive three hours. So um, I always like coming to Toronto, um, but uh, this is great. I can still be with you. And I'm here with my wife, uh, Abigail, and my three kids. You can't see them. They're just sitting on the, the couch off to the side and we're, we're projecting the meeting so that they can um, they can watch and I don't have to keep moving the computer around. So, um, okay, I'll get started. So for uh, the exhortation today, I decided to take a look through the three readings and there was a phrase that jumped out at me in <clears throat> Galatians chapter five. Uh, and that kind of became the basis for what I'm going to talk about today. It's in uh, Galatians five verse seven. Um, he, there's this phrase, uh, you did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And it's that expression, obey the truth, the truth that really stood out to me and, and got me thinking. In chapter five, Paul describes how ideas were entering their, their fellowship and, and distorting their persuasion of the truth. And this term, the truth is a very common New Testament expression. Actually, you know, Christadelphians use the, the term all the time. It's, it's something that we're uh, quite familiar with. The Greek word aletheia, it describes something as being factual. That's what it really means. Something is factual, it's, it's the truth. And we'll look at some verses a little later on that, that show that the truth or that expression is synonymous with the gospel. It's an important concept that the gospel is qualified as being the factual truth. It's the reality of everyone's existence. You can accept and obey the truth and live forever. Or be condemned in your sins and die when you die. That's reality. Increasingly in our society, the notion of sin is unacceptable, and the notion of truth is relative. I work as a high school teacher in, in a public high school in Kingston, but uh, my wife and I and, and my three, we, we decided to homeschool our kids, our three kids. So even though I work in public education, I've opted to homeschool our kids. And as a result of that, I've had lots of difficult conversations with teachers and, and other school staff um, because there's sort of an inherent contradiction there that you homeschool your kids, but you work in public education. Recently, I had a conversation with a teacher about this and why we homeschool our kids. And I told them what I believed. I told them the truth that I, I didn't agree with many of the agendas that were being pushed down in public education. And I didn't want my kids to be indoctrinated with ultra liberal values. He was actually fairly supportive. And we talked for quite a while about this growing silent majority in Canada who, who don't like the direction our society is going, but are basically too afraid to say anything. It kind of feels like if you have an alternate belief to the mainstream social movements, you have to keep quiet 
for fear of being labeled as a bigot or a religious zealot or some other nasty label. I hope that none of you has experienced this kind of pressure, but for me, working in the education system, it's basically par for the course. And I often find myself just keeping quiet to conceal my true beliefs. And I don't think that's a good thing, but that's really where I find myself these days. So this teacher I was talking to, he told me about a term that uh, is being used and it's called illiberalism. Uh, it's basically a term that means intolerance of intolerance. So it's an intolerance of any beliefs that are, are deemed to be non-inclusive. Sometimes attempts are even made to silence the opinions of opponents and to demonize people who have different belief sets. Uh, for example, you may have heard of a, a popular movement that has the nickname Cancel Culture, uh, which refers to activists who successfully protest and, and shut down public speakers who have views that are deemed as non-inclusive. The reality is that I think the human rights slash social justice movements are, are shifting our society to be increasingly in opposition to biblical teaching. The Bible teaches that there is an absolute truth called the truth. Our society teaches that there are truths, plural. This is a challenge to the truth, and it's, it's actually nothing new. Um, we'll take a look at the word, famous words that uh, Pilate spoke to Jesus in John chapter 18. Uh, so you can turn it up if you want. I'll be quoting quite a few passages, and I'm probably just going to read them off uh, the sheet that I have just to accelerate things a bit. So <clears throat> John chapter 18, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So in this, in this profession, Jesus declares himself as king, uh, which is 50% of the gospel, that Jesus is the king and the son of David. The purpose of Jesus is to bear witness of the truth. And that's the other half of the gospel, that there is only, only life through repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else. Carrying on in, in verse 38 of John 18, Pilate says unto him, Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. In asking the question, what is truth? Pilate is asserting that there is no such thing as the truth. I wonder if this could be the first recorded act of humanism. He's not hurting anybody. I don't agree with him, but whatever, he's fine. It's, it's his truth. It's, it's not my truth, but he's just a poor carpenter man. He could not threaten my truth. I'm the governor. So he doesn't take him very seriously. But on the contrary, God is a God of truth, and his truth is absolute. Now, in modern society, the concept of one single absolute truth has actually become an offensive belief. The current acceptable stance is that everyone should have their own truth. There is your truth and there's my truth. And since there are multiple truths, you can't also categorize any behavior as sin other than intolerance so intolerance becomes the only sin other than overtly hurting people i'll tell you another story about a recent news item that i listened to in early september there was a municipal councillor in the city of belleville and he was calling for mp derek sloan to be kicked out of the conservative caucus uh, essentially 
on account of his religious beliefs. Derek Sloan is a Seventh-day Adventist. The, the counselor, Nathan Townen, describes how Derek St Sloan's beliefs are incompatible with the definition of inclusivity. According to Nathan Townend, the essence of inclusivity isn't tolerance of opposing beliefs, but instead one has to adopt the perspective of the marginalized groups in society. It's not simply enough to live peacefully and tolerate marginalized groups, but you must believe as they believe and see the world as they see the world. Those are basically his words, a slight paraphrase. So as this attitude grows that you have to adopt the perspective of the marginalized, I think this means that anyone who asserts that there is only one truth and remains faithful to biblical principles will face ever-growing negative sentiment in the world. And the Bible tells us that believers will face persecution leading up to Christ's return. Christians in, in the West have enjoyed tremendous religious freedom for centuries, but we will face increasing negative pressure if we stay true to biblical teachings. The Bible describes a value set which is increasingly at odds with the humanistic society we live in. I mean, think about it on a macro scale. When Jesus returns, he will subject all nations to his authority. And there will be only one accepted form of worship. Any behavior that doesn't conform to God's righteousness will be openly condemned and gradually eradicated. This is the truth that we believe and hope for. In the meanwhile, as we wait his return and have to live amongst people who mostly despise the idea of one truth, what should we do? We live in a time when there are many social justice movements sweeping through the world, attempting to improve the conditions of man and the planet. I think it's natural that Christians take interest in social justice issues because we should care about what's happening to people and what's happening to the planet. However, I think we need to guard against involvement, direct involvement in social justice causes, because ultimately we're going to find that our belief sets are not at all aligned. Social justice is always about promoting individual liberties. Individual freedom is not the end goal of the gospel. Christ teaches us to make ourselves servants and to deny our natural inclinations. I'll read from uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. This is Jesus speaking. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The gospel is not in harmony with the charter of rights and freedoms. According to the charter, everyone has the right to A, freedom of conscience and religion, B, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. In the kingdom age, these freedoms will not exist. So it's kind of a catch-22 because the freedoms we enjoy in Canada allow us to openly worship and express our faith. But ultimately we are preaching that Jesus will return and take away these freedoms. So how do we navigate a world that is obsessed with individual freedoms? How do we act as bright lights for the gospel message in an increasingly antagonistic setting? Most of us probably have questions and may even feel conflicted about social justice causes, such as environmentalism, feminism, mistreatment of LGBTQ communities. Jesus cares about all people, and he wants all people to come to him. As followers of Jesus, we also care about people, and we care about the creation. 
it's tempting to try to fix the world by getting involved with social justice movements. Because on the surface, some movements promote beliefs that followers of Jesus agree with. For example, one message of the Bible is that believers should be completely non-discriminatory based on race, gender, or birth conditions. In Galatians 3, verse 26, we have some well-known words describing the gospel. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. James chapter 3 describes how believers shouldn't, shouldn't discriminate against other people. Uh, reading from James 3 verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality or discrimination, and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. In our reading today in Galatians chapter 6, uh, it says, as we, there, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. From these verses, it's clear that we should express an interest in the welfare of all people and seek opportunities to do good in society. The human rights movement on the whole appears to advance good causes that align with Christian values. But I think we should be guarded about expressing support for some efforts because they may reveal themselves as being opposed to biblical teachings. Some social justice movements in advocating for individual liberty end up being purely humanistic. The principal issue with humanism is that it denies the existence of sin. I've looked into various definitions of humanism. There's so many, I couldn't really pick one. I couldn't decide. There's so many agencies and, and organizations that describe themselves as clubs or advocates of humanism. And they all have definitions on their, on their websites of what humanism is. And the one thing that they all seem to have in common is that they actually attribute all the evil in the world to belief in God. And they believe that there's no such thing as sin and, and that belief in sin is actually the root of all evil. Consider the events that took place in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> God told Adam and Eve the truth. If you sin, you will die. The serpent told the original lie, which has remained and continues to destroy people. The serpent said, if you sin, you will not die. So who's right, God or the serpent? I used to be surprised that nations would oppose Jesus Christ when he returns. I could not conceive how anyone would fight against the Son of God establishing the kingdom on earth. I used to wonder, will people just be confused about who Jesus is and not really understand what he's doing? I've actually come to realize that it's not confusion at all. It's flat out rejection. The world doesn't actually want what God's offering in many cases. Humans think that they know how to solve their own problems. They think that they know better than God. <clears throat> Humans don't really want the message of God that there's only one truth. They prefer individual freedom to the kingdom of God. They don't want a king at all. They, they want a world where every man is his own king. 
In Luke chapter 18, uh, verse 8, Jesus says, Nevertheless, <clears throat> when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Which serves as, a rem as sort of a warning that it's very easy for even the faithful to be deceived. And I think the danger for us is that as time goes on and we're waiting for our Lord to return, it's easy for the clarity of the gospel, the clarity of our hope, to become eroded by humanistic philosophy. The lines kind of get blurry between wanting to help people and wanting <clears throat> to preach the gospel. So the exhortation is that we need to mentally prepare ourselves for this tide of antagonistic philosophies out there and remain faithful to the truth. Don't be sucked in by the sea and the waves roaring. In describing the period before, before his return, Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 21, uh, these are words that I've heard read quite frequently in many Bible studies that I've participated in through Zoom uh, because they feel so relevant right now in, the, in this strange period we live in. Verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Focusing in on the emblems now, the bread and the wine, remind us of the work that Jesus did. He prepared for us a way to be reconciled to God. Our sins alienate us from God. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can make our way back to God. God wants us to understand what sin is and that God has no tolerance of sin. God wants us to make full acknowledgement of our sins and reject a life of sin and choose to live a godly life. The wretched suffering of Jesus teaches us about the horribleness of sin, as well as the deceptive nature of man, a nature that's in all of us. Remember the truth, the gospel is the ultimate bringer of peace, equality and harmony on earth. Turn to John chapter 14. Well, actually, you don't need to turn it up, but um, words that were also played as part of the hymn, one of the hymns that we, we listened to at the start. Um, <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. These words, well-known words spoken by Jesus, are extremely controversial today. This message is 100% exclusive of individual rights and freedoms. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way. You don't get to decide or have multiple truths. There's no other way. In John 8, uh, verse 31, there's some other interesting words. Feel free to turn it up. John 8, verse 31. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Jesus described true freedom as knowing and obeying the truth. Even the religious leaders of Jesus' day failed to recognize their bondage to sin. 
In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In, conc in conclusion, the exhortation is the same as Paul's to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So this morning, let us be renewed in our persuasion of the truth. True freedom is freedom from sin. This is what Jesus has accomplished for us. And this is our message to the world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brother Justin. Um, at this time, can we do our uh, memorial hymn? Uh, which one is it? 235? Well, I'd like to, on behalf of everybody, thank uh, Brother Justin for that exhortation. It's uh, a very relevant exhortation uh, to Christians today because we live in a world where humanism dominates and we're surrounded in it and we're faced with choices um, as to how and when we should uh, participate with uh, with the world and when is it right when is it wrong and 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 how and how we, how should we um, distinguish between uh, what we should and shouldn't be do 
be doing in our jobs, in our social lives, uh, even ecclesially. So it's a um, very relevant subject. And I'm, I'm glad uh, that, uh, that Brother Justin chose to share that with us this morning. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, when we, when we look at humanism, and we look at everybody on this planet, generally speaking, we can agree that we want peace on earth, we want uh, an end to suffering, we want freedom. Um, so you might ask, where, where is, where's the problem then? Um, and I think, I think the, the, uh, the problem is that we disagree on, on the source of the problem and what the solution is, because um, the Bible teaches us that human nature is the problem and that God has the solution whereas humanism teaches that God is a problem or is unnecessary and that humans have the answers to save themselves. And so <clears throat> depending on the view you take, uh, you have a choice. Do you want to trust and obey human will to, to solve the world's issues and to solve the problems or do you want to trust and obey God's will? to solve all the problems that exist in life and in the world. Um, and when we read Galatians chapter five, the, 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 the exhortation was so suitable and so well suited to this reading. It, it, it really explains that, that, that different approach, uh, the flesh versus the spirit, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So um, these two are contrary to another and you and we need to make a choice as to whether we want to look to humanity for the our solutions or to trust and obey God and his will for the solution to to sin and to the world's problems. Um, and you know I think in, in conclusion when we go about our lives, um, we, need to, uh, we need to be careful that in our activities and efforts, we wanna do good, um, but we need to be careful that in our activities and efforts, we're, it's, it's, it's us allowing God's light to shine and, um, and we're to demonstrate and, and, and teach that God has the solution and not the light of the, um, not the flesh's light, not the, not to teach and to, to put our trust in, in um, our own arms to save us. So I think, I think that kind of needs to be, uh, that's a, maybe a, a way we can um, be helped to, to, to um, live our lives and, and to um, kind of guide us as we make some of the difficult decisions we have to make um, and we look to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our example. Um, he made it very clear that he didn't trust in his flesh. He didn't trust in his will to save him. He trusted, he made his choice. And it was a difficult choice, but he made it most de definitively. He made the choice to, to trust in God's will and to follow God's will to the cross uh, and to have his own fleshly will and body destroyed. And so that is our example. And ultimately that is how the world's problems will be solved in, in, in the destruction of, of what is fleshly and um, the reign of God's will on this earth. So that needs to be our guiding light in all that we do. And Jesus needs to be our example in that. And so we are here to remember him this morning, his, his life, death and resurrection. And that is, um, that is what he stood for, uh, the following of God's will as opposed to his own. And I'll read the, um, just a few verses to prepare our minds in, in, in remembering um, his offering, his sacrifice. It says, Paul wrote, um, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For, so, for as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And uh, Brother Jim Perks has volunteered to um, say a word of thanks for the bread. Let us thank our Heavenly Father. Our Father who art in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be thy great and thy wonderful name. We thank thee at this time for this bread that has been prepared for us, that we may remember that this is from our Lord, that died for us, that we may have life. And we see an example of him putting to death his human nature and following after the example of thee in thy ways. He has followed thy word. And we pray that this bread that represents the word of God, that we also may follow that same example and do those things that are pleasing in thy sight. Watch over us, guide us, forgive us when we fail and encourage us to continue on that path that leads to life. For it's through thy son, even our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we ask this. Amen. We'll now have a, a, a moment to take of the bread in our, our homes. In the same way after he, it's written in the same way after he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me i've asked brother uh, percy william to say a word of thanks for the wine let's pray for the wine our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and holy name. A few of your humble servants approach unto your throne of grace at this time to offer thanks for this wine. This wine, which represents the spilled blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, so our sins are forgiven. We thank you for that great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We ask that you will forgive us of our shortcomings. We pray that each of us will examine ourselves and drink from this cup in a worthy manner. We pray that we will gain strength and knowledge from the words and thoughts we have just heard from Brother Justin. We pray that you will send your son Jesus soon to set up his kingdom on earth. We pray that by partaking of this wine, we will be found worthy of a place in that glorious kingdom. We hope and pray that we will be able to continue to meet around your table until that glorious day. We ask all these things and through your son Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Percy. We'll now have a, a brief moment to partake of the wine in our in our various meeting places.
Well, I'd like to thank uh, once again, um, Brother Justin for his words of exhortation to us this morning, to everybody who, who participated, read and prayed, um, to everybody here for, for coming together and, and joining in fellowship and um, participating in the service this morning. We'll be closing uh, with him 379 and following that um, we'll have a closing prayer by brother Tim Narges and after that um, uh, I ask that you remain for uh, for the week's uh, announcements so him 379. Gracious Father in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thy most holy name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time we have together today to sing praise to your name, to be to read from your word of truth, to be encouraged and edified, to remain strong based on that word of truth and especially Father to remember your son, our Lord Jesus Christ in bread and wine, who, whose good confession to Pilate, good confession of faith to Pilate, reminds us of the great hope and calling that we all share. And we share it because it is you, Heavenly Father, who has given us this opportunity to Embrace the gospel message, a gospel message which, uh, which is conveyed to us through your word and has transcended time, even transcended time, is timeless. For we are reminded, Father, that you are the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of the living. We ask, Father, that you will continue with each of us as we 
continue on our pilgrimage towards that great and glorious kingdom. And help us to remember that there is no I in the sons of God or the daughters of God, but that we are worked together collectively to help each other on that same path that leads to life. And we do look forward, Heavenly Father, for that great day that uh, we will be together with you and your son, working together to est in establishing and ruling, the, ruling on the kingdom of God. And may we have a place herein to help with that great plan and purpose. So be with each of us this day and be with us always. For we give you praise and thanks for all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Tim. Um, so the following are the weekly announcements for Sunday, October 4th, 2020. All announcements are subject to the will of God. Um, so once again, thanks to Brother Justin for his exhortation, very relevant and um, useful exhortation. Uh, thanks to all who helped, attended, especially visitors. Bible class this week will be October 7th on Zoom at 7.30 p.m. Presiding Brother Dennis Dawes and speaking Brother Ken Eason. Top, the topic will be how does our Heavenly Father train his children? Welfare report. We rejoice together in the marriage of Julie and Adam Winfrey. They were united yesterday in a ceremony in Virginia. Um, I was watching it. I, 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 I think many of many of you were also watching it. Um, it was a very nice ceremony. Um, we wish them God's blessing on their walk together. Um, we are sorry to report that Sister Mary Perks uh, Barry, wife of Brother Walter Perks and sister-in-law of Brother Jim Perks, passed away uh, last Saturday, September 26th. Sister Mary had been suffering from serious health issues for many years, and we look forward to seeing our sister again in the resurrection. Our prayers are with Brother Walter and the Perks family at this time. On a happier note, we are pleased to announce that an um, Another Sunday school student was baptized uh, last week into the uh, saving name of Jesus Christ and Cambridge, um, Alan Huck, daughter of brother Rob and sister Julie Huck. I hope I'm saying that last name right. Um, and this just came in this morning, uh, a note from uh, Johnny Abel uh, of the Cambridge Ecclesia. And he wanted to uh, let us know, uh, we wanted to communicate the wonderful news that another of our Sunday school students has decided to take on the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cole Andrews, son of Brother Jared and Sister Beth Andrews will be baptized tomorrow. That's right now, or maybe it's probably already happened, God willing, during the Cambridge Memorial meeting. The Lord is not willing that any should perish and we rejoice that he reminds of us of this continually. May he come soon. A reminder to, and just a reminder to keep everyone uh, in their prayers, um, to remember the, the, uh, those among us who, who may be sick or um, unable to leave. Um, some general announcements. Um, there will be a fraternal gathering held on Thanksgiving weekend in Vancouver that will be available on Zoom. We don't have connection details at this time, but connection details will be forthcoming. And there's a reminder not to leave, just a general reminder, not to leave behind any garbage um, if you happen to visit the hall. Next Sunday, uh, Brother Phil DeWire is presiding and Brother Des Amos is exhorting. And the collections um, for this week, the second collection is for ASK. 
Um, and next week, the second collection is for Agape in Action. And those donations, as well as the regular donations, can be sent to Brother Josh Narages. Um, and, and just a note to remember to send that to his new email address, not the old one. And that concludes uh, this week's announcements. And um, I'm not sure if, if we have any uh, an, an extra hymn lined up or if, if not, then we can, uh, okay, do we have another one lined up or do we go to the, uh, just the fellowship right now? We don't have another hymn lined up. Okay. But one more announcement. The yep. um, Vancouver Ecclesia is having their fraternal gathering next weekend. Thanksgiving weekend. Brother Phil Snowblen at the Vancouver Ecclesia is the one helping to organize it. I sent a flyer to Sylvia and um, as soon as I find out the Zoom information, I will send it to Sylvia to send around to everybody. So uh, for those of us who are missing the fall gathering today, there is another gathering. There is a possibility for a gathering next Sunday, the next Saturday and Sunday. The theme of that gathering is, um, <laughs> the theme for the, the, the theme for the talks is uh, the stone. And they have, they have four different uh, speakers from around the world to uh, speak. Okay, thanks. Thanks Kay for that uh, notice. And uh, at this point we, it's meetings is closed and, uh, and uh, the floor is open to fellowship and conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to update something there. It, um, the name was Maria. Um, and it was Sunday morning that she actually passed away, not Saturday. And uh, it was, yeah, it was quite a shock, I must say, to, to us uh, because she was in her 56 years. So you're not expecting somebody uh, that young, even though we knew that she had, uh, she had lupus and it, apparently it can be quite a painful a painful disease so yeah, it was a much a shock and, and most people were at the uh, the wedding yesterday we were at the funeral so um, anyways uh, just so everybody knows what was going on but and it, the, the big thing is is now she waits for the hope of the resurrection uh, when our lord returns to this earth so yeah, there's always that positive part to our funerals so anyways thanks everybody Jim and Karen, my sincerest sympathies and condolences. It's never easy when somebody we love passes. And as much as we look forward to the hope of Christ and to see them again, we do miss them day to day. So my sincere condolences to both of you. Yeah, thanks very much, Kay. Yeah, and the uh, John Andrews did the uh, service and he did a lovely job, did a really good job. And it was, uh, a lot of beautiful things that were said there that made you realize uh, um, just how positive she was. And even though, you know, we hadn't spent recently that much time up there talking, then we had, did see them the last, last time I was up there uh, doing the exhortation. So it was, it was, I was glad that we got up there, but I just wish we got up there more often. So, but thank you very much for the, the, the positive part and you're right. Um, with the hope of the kingdom, <clears throat> it, you don't sorrow as other people, but you do miss them because we're still alive and they aren't. So yeah, you do miss them. So thank you. <laughs>